Ladies and gentlemen, by way of introduction, this is a film about trickery and fraud, about lies. Tell it by the fireside or in a marketplace or in a movie. Almost any story is almost certainly some kind of lie. But not this time. No, this is a promise. During the next hour, everything you'll hear from us is really true and based on solid fact. Well, of that world to begin with. No. Maybe there's a better way to put it. This is a place that exists between reality and fantasy. Look! <laughs> He's done it! Atlas has done it again, and they've been doing it all year long. But the biggest JRPG title comes not from Persona, and not from Shin Megami Tensei, but unexpectedly a new IP from the big three. And they aren't shy in letting us know it. They say you can separate the art from the artist. Well... I'd never want to separate these artists from their work, because when Hashino, Soejima, and Megaro get together, the result can be nothing less than the best of all their talents in their respective fields put together. Storytelling, art design, and music. The first and best of all magic to enter the world. This is bad. They're onto us. As Persona's great singer, Len, put it best in writing for Atlas's 35th anniversary, Atlas is about putting the people first. Atlas is about the artists. It takes extreme confidence to reach the very pinnacle of your creative and commercial success and then suddenly pivot to a new studio in service of creating a whole new IP, a new chapter of the legendary creator's books. Meanwhile, P-Studio continues to milk the said pinnacle for all it's worth until the creative energy runs dry. But let's try to ignore that here. There is no room for caution if you want the world's eyes on you. You cannot just read your favorite novel over and over again. Taking risks, this is what artists do. They don't rest on their laurels. It's not about refining every brushstroke until you get it just right. The way these remakes and remasters spur on plagiarism of the OCD kind. We want to keep dreaming and, more importantly, to experience new dreams. Metaphor Re Fantasio is less of a reimagining of Atlas and more of a greatest hits version of their most popular games in one. Similar to how Elden Ring was thought by many to be the culmination of previous disparate design choices into a unified whole, like Elden Ring, Metaphor is not unlike anything we've seen or felt from the developers or the genre itself. But in some ways, it's a maturation of the themes and an improvement on mechanics that Persona made pop in an arguably less stylish but more substantive, more focused adventure. It's a stark contrast between the plagiarism of Persona 3 and the long self-imposed delay of Persona 6 with the originality and daring of this new metaphor to take all of the world's biggest problems as its subject matter and to inspire us to grapple with the solutions through the looking glass. I have not played every single game of the year, and I don't need to, because this is Atlas, and one of their games is bound to take the crown this calendar year, whether or not the industry circle jerk ceremony has the integrity to award a JRPG the title for once. As always, the world of metaphor takes place between mind and matter, reality and fantasy, and the brilliance of this narrative device can be explained by a theory that I've been working on for a while about the meaning of art and the significance of storytelling. This may offend some people, but it's true. Art is religion, but religion is not art. We can use storytelling to inspire us, because through heroes and fiction we can be who we want to but cannot be in the real world. We can go places we otherwise cannot go. The characters that we learn to love and applaud or otherwise detest and denounce are truly just versions of ourselves, our confrontation with the real through the sublime. They have meaning because we give it to them. Nothing is ordained until we ordain it. Nothing is written until we write it. Fantasy is the testament for having the will to believe, but only because we can believe in those that have the will to change. The foundation of this fantasy is built on the same great pillars of tribalism found in the real world, religion and politics. 
Just as these hot topics can bring out the worst in us, fantasy can make people act as savages as well, as the Persona fanbase knows all too well. Disagreement is part of human nature, and life probably wouldn't be as interesting without a good debate. But what every sensible gamer can agree on is that Metaphor is a great game. If not for any other reason, then it respects the imagination and intelligence of its audience, and giving us escapism that doubles as education. Reality is cruel, but fantasy is not far off. We use it to fill in the gaps, to say the things we would otherwise be criticized for and in some jurisdictions be jailed for, hung at the gallows for. If you believe that fantasy can be a tool to transform the world, then there is hope and virtue in storytelling. Atlas believes there is too, and so do I, which is why the writing of metaphor works so well as meta-commentary on art itself and life's imitation of it. As Orson Welles said, almost all of reality is certainly a lie, which is why we seek comfort in fantasy, because stories shed light on the truth. Religion fails as truth, because it is truly fiction purporting itself to be reality. You have to tell people that your story is just a story, that the words of wisdom come from an author in the flesh, and not a mysterious entity among the skies. That is, if you want people to truly believe in the words you preach, and the world that you speak of. If religion had simply been a metaphor, then maybe it would have had meaning all along, minus the barbaric human cruelty which actually far predates the barbarians. Metaphor confronts this schism head-on, encouraging us to embrace creativity and stray from the traps of blind faith, whether in the form of authority figures or dogma. The so-called Sanctus Church is the most accurate reflection of real-world theocratic governance, in which the church undermines the crown and common citizenry for control over all. It enforces the customs, the creed, and most significantly the credulity of everyday people that are too anxious to seek their own truth. It's no plot twist that this institution is a corrupt one, almost cartoonishly so, and it's perfectly contrasted with the role of Luis, a man whose vicious means know no bounds in pursuit of his ends, but one who gets things done through practical employ of his skills, while the floating rock in the sky does nothing to quell the outrage or concern. We need to have fiction more than religion or any other superstition, because we must always be reminded that it is people that make art, and people that can change the world. As Yufa says, before you fold your hands in prayer, stretch them out to the people around you. We must cherish ideas and people, and remember that a story is only a story until you give the authors, the people, the credit for their imagination. In the current cultural wars that have engulfed gaming discourse, we are often told that games should not be political. Like most things, the truth is in the middle. It is true that art should not be didactic. That is to say that art should not be preachy in the way of reciting verbose and verbatim factoids to us that we could easily read on the front page of a newspaper headline. The facts found in phone books, as Herzog would say. Art should not condescend to its audience or try to assume their audience is guilty, the way the self-aggrandizing social justice warrior would do, the one that wishes to treat everyone both equal and lesser than themselves. Art must be nuanced. It must have subtext. Imagine if instead of using the made-up tribes to show how everyone is prejudiced out of fear and ignorance of different cultures, that the game trying to only point to white people as the true authors of discrimination, as if it was some inherent sin belonging to one race rather than a consequence of the system, dividing us through propaganda so that we could only be easily conquered when we're too busy going for each other's throats, to direct our attention toward the true source of our strife, the system that binds us. Rather than preaching to the choir about the myths of racial privilege and racial guilt, we receive the universal message of personal worth that comes from one's own deeds and not one's status of birth. Corruption is as universal as innocence, and everyone can change from one extreme to the next. In the end, we are all equal, but not everyone is treated fairly. Fantasy helps us to see more clearly who we really are, so that we one day might start acting honestly. The truth is that politics and religion are boring and full of lies meant to divide us. It is philosophy and fantasy that are interesting, where the points of truth intersect and we can unite without conditions, like the language of Esperanto used internationally to signify togetherness. 
When the messaging feels contrived and poorly enforced through artificial and dishonest assumptions, it becomes cringe and cynical. But Atlas is just smarter with her storytelling, giving us metaphors instead. And so we get Archetypes, a simplified approach to capturing demons and personas where everyone can mix and match their moves through sharing and synthesis. Through sharing bonds, we share skills that can be used to customize our play styles in nearly any way we want. You can stack up on archetypes of a given lineage to exploit one weakness in particular, earning additional buffs for having multiple warriors of the same kind. You can grind to get the elite passive traits for one archetype and make a jack-of-all-trades character, or just focus on making your protagonist a specialist through the allocation of manual skill points. At first glance, it would seem that your party composition becomes irrelevant if you can just transfer their abilities to everyone else. But the archetypes combine in tandem with their preset attributes, such as Heisme being great for agility and Basilio being in demand for strength, meaning that party composition stays strategic and personalized. Given the greater emphasis placed on real-time combat, skills like the default gunner crossbow attacks have practical usage in dungeon crawling as you can just sit back and press a single button to farm the XP. Staying locked on from a distance and even being able to teleport directly to an enemy to slice through them like butter. These archetype skills make the HP and MP recovery automatic by just engaging in the real-time encounters, many of which can be finished without ever engaging in the holdup of turn-based battle. The turn-based is a nice sweet spot between Persona and SMT mechanics, where striking weaknesses and landing critical hits rewards the attacker with follow-ups, and any wrong move by choice or RNG can shorten or outright end your turn. I do miss the baton pass and the all-out attacks from Persona 5 and some of the flashier animations in those games, but I do like the metaphor is more stringent in its gameplay, punishing you for mistakes and rewarding you for your precision. A boss can buff itself an extra 8 turn icons at once, and you can delete them all with a single repel. The game can still be trivialized depending on the tactics that you use, such as being able to restart the battle completely if you made a wrong move, or spamming extra press turn items to extend yourself. In truth, this is a quality of life improvement so you don't have to rely on dragging out the fight you know you're in a disadvantage for. RNG is a huge part of the equation, so giving some extra manipulation to the players just feels like the right move. The one area of critique that I have is the dungeons themselves. Their bland layouts and lack of enemy variety not inspiring much excitement to make me want to explore or giving me much encouragement for the replay value. For a game that took as many years in development as have passed between the last main Persona game and still no announcement of the next main Persona game, we all would have expected more intricate designs in the style of that last bestseller. Much was made of the mythical status of this long-awaited passion project, yet for budget constraints or whatever excuse there may be, more detail was taken to colorize the world map than to get creative in the actual map locations. The dungeons feel very much like SMT3, although minus several IQ points needed to solve and without the constant pressure of needing to avoid and strategize enemy encounters to survive. You can ambush almost every non-boss fight available, never having to fight anything at full strength. This gives you the opportunity to get the unscathed battle rewards, yet the general XP never feels completely satisfactory until you lower the difficulty to easy mode. Every dungeon here has an enemy spawner for the trash mobs, assuming that you've done enough prerequisite grinding in the previous dungeon to be on a level playing field to grind them out. It's quality of life in a lackluster setting, a practice reserved best for the final dungeon, which is essentially just a killing floor anyway. I like the fact that you can convert the additional XP that you harvest directly into items that you can then use to upgrade the archetypes in any way that you wish. I like how the archetypes carry over to New Game Plus, along with most of your support items as well, though you still have to redo the follower ranks in order to gain access back to them. I just wish that the areas that you visit to fight were as entertaining as that main battle theme music is. Probably the one thing that keeps me going in this game besides the story. Everything about the pace of the writing and the story events feels more natural than Persona and anime in general. 
The dialogue is eloquent and efficient, saying only what needs to be said to preserve the context and the thematic cohesion. The jokes do the game justice in the same way the serious tone makes us care about the state of the world. You have to be able to laugh a little in order to appreciate what it is that you're fighting for. Metaphor shows us how sadness can stir the feelings we forgot that we had, like when a certain character makes a sacrifice so that we can be king for a better future. And it also has the wisdom and nobility to show how happy endings can be pure and deserved. Like when Alonzo turns out to have pulled just another trick on us when we had underestimated him. For a storybook-style text simulator, the adventure aspect is perhaps as immersive as a game like Elden Ring, both visually and verbally. Boarding the Gauntlet Runner and setting off on the next journey with your allies is like taking a trip with your classmates on the magical school bus. It's a home away from home, a hub area perfect for the campaigners of the Royal Resistance. The same way that LeBlanc was a low-key hideout for the teenage superheroes. And that's not counting the fantasy version of LeBlanc, the Hushed Honeybee, and various other haunts throughout the kingdom that feel cozy just as well. So much happens in so little time on the runner, and I love how randomly the other candidates will pull up alongside you for a fight, putting out silly campaign propaganda and ending with a concession speech. The game knows when to be goofy, and the game knows when to get heavy. The flowery musings of the narrator describing events that are felt but not seen along our journey paint a more vivid picture than anything that could be shown to us. The tragic backstories of the main characters set up the perfect payoffs for their arcs to unfold in the most satisfactory of ways. Overall, it's some of Atlas's best writing, some of its boldest narrative choices delivering truly memorable characters and moments to us. They feel original and pure, not in any way, shape, or form like pandering or stereotypical offerings to us in a game that otherwise preaches against such behavior. Quality and quantity is here, abridged in length but always about something to return. The cantankerous Neros's optimistic neurosis gives everyone aboard a morale boost. Gallica is your angel on your shoulder, always giving you commentary and guiding you through helpful hints about where to go next. Hulkenberg has the authentic aura of a knight of old, with the proper balance of self-serious absurdity and over-the-top humor like a Lazelle from Baldur's Gate 3. Many of the characters have finales that are as intriguing as their introductions, and most importantly, the game's themes remain powerful even after the sobering feeling post-plot twist seeps in. It's a ridiculous statement that many fans have made that we shouldn't compare Metaphor to Persona, as if Persona is some kind of a bad omen. We wouldn't be getting such a game as ReFantasia without the original fantasy, and this game goes out of its way to remind us of those other great IPs that our veterans work so hard on. It's like Persona, but a little more adult and maybe a little more freeing with your time. The followers drink up independent of dialogue options or needing the right persona equipped to give bonus points. The map opens up gradually and exploration operates within the same calendar constructs, but it's all part of a planned journey according to your curiosity. As time marches on and a new king does draw near, so are we drawn deeper down the rabbit hole of the metaverse. The true detail is in the NPCs of the world, their various talking points providing clues into the game's lore, and just generally making the kingdom of Ukronia feel alive with its prejudice, humor, and appeal to our true nature of compassion. I spent 150 hours combing every nook and cranny of this world, and I came away feeling like a traveler tried and true. The beauty is the true commodity of JRPGs from Atlas. Fantasy serves as a reminder that the concentration of power is meaningless when only a few people have the power. To strike the perfect balance between delicate and bold is to make a game worthy of our attention. This is not a game made by and for algorithms. It's a game made by JRPG fans for JRPG fans. A statement of intent to bring more fans into the fold and to show that video games are another extension of the art of storytelling. Let me reiterate that it takes extreme confidence to leave behind the pivotal Persona series right after making the game that put Atlas at the very top of the gaming world with P5R, which is still their magnum opus, and search for loftier ambition. Really, it's just the great designers staying true to their roots, doing what they know how to do best on their terms and their collective creative vision. These are the minds behind some of the most confident games ever made, and so too is Metaphor. 
It's the kind of confidence that can only be exuded by industry professionals with 35 years of experience, artisans that have already earned that Lifetime Achievement Award and don't care about further recognition from peers or fans. These developers simply love to make games, to share their imaginations with others, because fantasy is what we need as much as what we want. Maybe there is no absolute virtue, but metaphor is close to perfect in more ways than one, yet still striving for further excellence in others, an attempt to make a peerless game if there ever could be such a thing. All Atlas fans and fans of JRPGs and games in general should give metaphor the same chance that we should give peace. It's a fantasy we should engrave on all of our hearts. <laughs> Can't forget a masterpiece like this! <laughs> <laughs>